you have a Bible, Colossians chapter three, Colossians chapter three. If you don't have a Bible, tables in the back should have a Bible. Uh, We would love for you to have that and keep that. Colossians chapter three, I'll give you a second to make your way there. It's all the way towards the end of your Bible. And at Story Church, it is uh, our belief that the word of God is from God himself. He has spoken it and uh, it it is about him and it is for us. And and because he has spoken, we like to honor his speaking. And so if you're willing and able, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Colossians 3, we're going to read verses 5 through 10 this morning. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put, away them, all, put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in, in knowledge after the image of its creator. This is the word of the Lord. Go ahead and grab a seat. Uh, we're going to do a short two-week series on sanctification uh, this week and next week. And then uh, the end of the month, we're going to open up Jonah. And we're going to spend about six or so weeks in the book of Jonah. So I'm super stoked on that. But for this week and next week, we're going to talk about sanctification. We're going to hit two aspects of sanctification, mortification and vivification. I'll explain all of that in a second. But before I do that... Uh, It is my conviction that I think there's two equal and opposite errors uh, that preachers can stumble into. Here's what I mean by that. On one side, I think preachers can stumble in being overtly seeker sensitive. Now, here's what I mean by that. This is the type of preacher that doesn't broach the subject of sin, you might hear them talk about bad habits or old hangups or, or things like that, but they're afraid because they're overly sensitive to, to your ears. They want to tickle your ears is what the scriptures say, and they don't want to talk about the subject of sin. Now, imagine you were to have a failing kidney and you went to a doctor and you needed a transplant, but he was like, you know, I'm not going not gonna to talk about that kidney. We're just going to ignore that for a second. It's going to be positive, 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 positive all the time. You'd fire that doctor and go get a new one, right? That'd be medical malpractice. It is the same thing for a preacher to not talk about the subject of sin. So so that's one side. I think the equal and opposite error is what we'll call licentious preaching. This is the type of preacher that in the same way doesn't talk about sin, but but the way they go about it is they say, uh, because grace abounds, therefore sin can abound, Like just, God's gonna cover all of it. You don't need to deal with your sin. You don't need to consider it. You don't need to talk about it. Let's just go ahead and consider the the unending grace of God. Well, Well, yes, we affirm the unending grace of God that covers our sin. We, alongside the apostle Paul say, because grace abounds, can sin abound all the more? By no means. Good biblical preaching modeled for us by Jesus, by the apostles, down through church history is to talk to Christians about their sin and what to do with their sin. Yes, you are forgiven and freed of your sin, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, but now as followers of the way of Jesus, we are committed to growing in sanctification. And it is my conviction that Story Church, we need to be more serious about our sanctification. We need to be holy as he is holy. First Thessalonians says that God's will for our lives is that we would be sanctified. Galatians tells us the purpose of the gospel is Christ being formed in us. Therefore, the old man dies. Romans, all over Romans, the apostle Paul again says the gospel is not licensed to sin. Good biblical preaching speaks of both the gospel for salvation and the gospel for sanctification. And so for the next two weeks, we're gonna kind of hone in on this idea of sanctification. I would be a horrible pastor if I didn't take my sin seriously. 
I would be a horrible pastor if I didn't take your sin seriously and the sin of our congregation at large seriously. I would be a horrible pastor if I didn't frequently discuss the topic of growing to look like Christ. I would be a horrible pastor if I did not w- warn you of the dangers of unrepentant sin. And so here's my attempt to not be a horrible pastor. Now, I've said sanctification a lot. Here's my working definition of the word sanctification becoming who you already are. That's what sanctification is, friends. Becoming who you already are. In the gospel, God sees you as he sees his own son, Jesus Christ. But if I compare my life to Jesus's life, they're not the same. And so therefore, I need to partner with God by the work of his spirit in my life to become more and more progressively one degree of glory to to another, looking more like Jesus, becoming who you already are. Who are you? Look at verse five. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Now, that word therefore, pointing backwards. This is saying, because of what I just said, therefore you need to put to death. What, What did Paul just say? Look at verses one through four with me. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek things that are above where Christ is is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Here's what Paul is saying there. You're forgiven you're freed, you're dead to sin, you're alive in Christ, you're hidden in Christ, which means you have assurance of salvation, you are loved, you possess grace and mercy, you're a son of God, you're a daughter of God, you have a future in Christ, you have no fear of death, there is no condemnation, God's love forever, you are righteous, you are holy, you are made new, you have a new heart, a new name, you are a saint. This is who you are in Christ. And sanctification is simply agreeing with that take and saying, I'm gonna do everything I can to look more and more and more and more and more like I already do. And so there's two separate aspects to sanctification. There's mortification and vivification. Mortify literally means put to death. This is where we get our word mortician, right? It's kind of a dated word, but it works. Means put to death. You hear Paul in here, put off, put away, do not walk in. This is the old man. This is who you are not. He says, put that to death. And then vivification means to put on, to walk in victory, to become who you are, to walk as Christ would walk. And so today I get the fun task of talking about mortification. So let's do some killing together. (laughs) Bet you never thought you'd hear that. All right, allergies. Three things, three things we're gonna look at. Number one, remaining sin. Number two, this idea of being ruthless or reckless. And then number three, the reward for our holiness. You guys with me? You guys want to get sanctified by Jesus? Okay, Uh, if you don't now, you will by the end, hopefully. First, remaining sin. Paul, again in verse five, says, put to death therefore what is earthly in you. And then he goes on to list a bunch of sin. And then later on in verse eight, he says, put away, and he lists a bunch more of sin. Now, for a second, consider with me, who is Paul writing to? Paul is writing to the Colossians. I heard it back there. Paul is not writing this kind of magnum opus for the world to read. The world does not care what the apostle Paul has to say. Paul is not pointing out a bunch of sin that's out there in the culture. He is writing to a bunch of Christians. And this is the story of the letters of the New Testament. Paul, like go read 1 Corinthians. You think we're jacked up? Read that book for a second. Right? Paul is writing to a bunch of churches in a bunch of different places saying, hey, I've, I've heard some reports. I don't like what I hear. You need to grow to look like Jesus. Now, there's this theological concept. In Latin, it goes like this. Simul justice et peccator. That means simultaneously sinner and saint. You are simultaneously a saint clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, but 
always having remaining sin within your life. And, and here's the, the wicked propensity that you and I have that we possess. We look outward and we see, man, there's a lost and a dying world out there. There's darkness out there. There's wickedness in this culture. And yes, there is. And frankly, your pastor is getting fed up with it. But listen, if all we do is look out there, we're missing what's going on right in in here. And when we do that, we're playing this little comparison game. I talk about it all the time. And when we play this comparison game, we are subtly submitting to the temptation of Satan to not take seriously our own sin. And so Paul is writing to the Christians at Colossae saying, you have remaining sin in your life. And this is not a uniquely New Testament thing. This is all over the Old Testament. In Psalm 51, King David is saying, my sin is ever before me. Have you ever said that? In Psalm 139, again, David is saying, God, know me and search me and see if there be any wicked way within me. I know I have remaining sin in your goodness, God. Will you show it to me? In Jeremiah 17, 9, the prophet says, your heart is wicked and deceitful above all else. If that's not opposite of follow your heart nonsense in our culture, I don't know what is. Follow your heart straight into wickedness, am I right? So it's not about what's out there. It's about what's going on in this room for those of us who claim Christ as Lord. And and then again, we have this wicked propensity to play the comparison game. So we import the game we're playing out there into this room and we begin to compare ourselves to others in this room. Like, listen, I I know I'm jacked up, Travis. You told me that. But don't you you know her story? Like, I I know know I'm screwed up and and I don't have my head on straight, but that guy is a mess. Compare ourselves to others. And then we compare our sin to the sin of others, right? Like, like, I know, I know, I know. I got a little drunk last night, but, but I didn't commit adultery, like, yeah, I know, I'm, I've got a gossiping problem, but I didn't murder anyone, right? We, we play this little game as if there are sins, small and great. Every sin is equally punishable by the wrath of God, which is what made the cross of Christ necessary in the first place. All sin, including the ones that you and I consider safe and secure. Like, I got a prayer request, but it's all about that person I just want to talk crap about. Sin. But here's what Paul is really trying to drive home to the Colossian church and to us. We have remaining sin. Every one of us, even if we claim Christ as Lord. And then what he does is is he just goes on and, and, and does a list. And so we're gonna walk through that list together. uh, And I'm gonna kind of explain briefly each of these sins that Paul is drawing out here. And so I think we've got a uh, a graph. How does it look? Hey, Scott, thank you, man. Where are you at? I sent that in a Word doc and he made it look good. Um, First, sexual immorality. This is the Greek word porneia. This is where we get our word pornography from. And this is an umbrella term talking about any and all sexual sin. Okay, so so lust, adultery, fornication, pornography, all of those things fall under this umbrella. Any type of sexual activity you have outside of the covenant of your marriage is sin in the eyes of God. So Paul is saying sexual immorality. Then he talks about impurity. This again is an umbrella term for any and all kind of moral corruption. Okay, so that's just his like haymaker. Like you're trying to wiggle out of this. It's just, we're morally corrupt. Okay, impurity, passion. This is an emotional lusting that lowers our inhibition. This is like when you get blinders on and, and you can't make the right decision. Like you've, I've gotta have it. I've gotta do it. I'm so overcome with passion that I gotta go get this thing. Uh, evil desire. This is an impulsive longing for evil things. Uh, I think this is a little bit of what Paul is talking about in Romans 7 when he says, I do the very thing I don't want to do. Anyone else? (laughs) There are a lot of things I don't want to do and I impulsively long after those things. Uh, Covetousness. This is an uncontrolled desire for more. You got the car, I got to get the car. 
You bought the bigger house, I gotta get the bigger house. My neighbor has it, therefore I have to get it. And if I could be honest with you, I did a little market research a few weeks ago with a group of people and listed all these and said, hey, uh, circle the, the top three that we struggle with at Story Church. To the person, covetousness was number one on the list. I think that's a major struggle of us at Story Church struggling with desiring what our neighbors have and sacrificing good things God has given us to go get more. Walking in a lack of generosity to go get more for ourselves. Uh, next one, anger. Anger uh, is a habitual posture of irritation or annoyance. A lot of times we think about anger as something that's like on the surface, but most often anger is just something that's kind of seething below the surface. And, and then you hear the term blow a gasket, it's like you did something to poke that bear and the, the bear came out, right? And, and, and so if you're easily irritated, you're easily annoyed by people, uh, you will struggle with anger. Uh, I, uh, one of our favorite comedians is a guy by the name of Sebastian Maniscalco. Uh, one of his favorite phrases is, I like to be bothered. Um, so he's like, I go to the gym and I just, want, I just people watch because I want to be bothered. That's, that's what struggling with anger is like. like. You just look around and you want to be bothered by people. What a way to live. Wrath. Wrath is what we think of most often as anger. Random, unprovoked outbursts of violence. It's like when your kid spills the milk and you're like, ah, oh! you know? Or someone cuts you off and you're like, dude, catch up to him. I gotta give him the bird. I gotta do it. I gotta do it. Okay, wrath. Malice. This is wishing ill will towards another person or creating ill will towards another person. Slander, uh, this is another one that's really high on our list, Story Church. Speech that tears others down to them or about them. Gossip is within the, the uh, umbrella of slander. And, and, and I say this all the time. If someone comes to you gossiping, shut that down. You wanna know why? For a lot of reasons, number one, God tells us to, but a secondary reason is because if they're willing to talk to you about someone else, they're gonna go talk to someone else about you too. Obscene talk, foul speech, coarse humor, biting sarcasm, lying to one another, bearing false witness about someone. And then uh, if he didn't get all of it because he was running out of papyrus, Paul's like the old self. Get rid of the old self, this umbrella term of how you used to be. Now again, if you don't find yourself on this list, do me the favor and raise your hand. I mean, even this week as I was studying and, and prepping for this, like one of the ones that stood out to me was obscene talk. My tongue gets me in trouble. It just does. Like making fun of people, because I think it's funny, but it hurts them. That's not okay. Right, foul speech, like pushing the envelope on, on what I'm trying to say and it doesn't represent the holiness of God. And that's not how I wanna live. So Paul is saying to all of us and driving it home, we have remaining sin. So how do we deal with it? How do we deal with this remaining sin in our lives? My son Owen uh, is named after an old dead theologian by the name of John Owen. He's one of the more influential thinkers in my life. He's written a ton of work. And if you're committed to reading John Owen, you're gonna be reading for the rest of your life. He is tough to read. But one of his most famous lines is this, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Now to contemporary ears, that sounds harsh, maybe melodramatic, maybe, maybe an overreaction to sin. But, but look at Paul's attitude towards sin in our lives. He says, put it to death, put it away. When he's saying put it away, he's saying, take the jersey of sin off, throw it in the fire and walk in the new way of Jesus Christ. Paul's attitude is this towards our sin, kill it. Put it to death, execute it. Don't let it live for another second. Take whatever steps necessary to eliminate sin from your life. Tolerate no compromise, take no prisoners, deal ruthlessly and radically with it, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant it may appear. That's what Paul is telling us to do when he says, put it to death. So friends, when you see the remaining sin in your life, you really only have two options. You can deal with it ruthlessly or recklessly. 
First, to be reckless is to lack caution, to be careless, to be negligent towards our sin. To be reckless is to not hate our sin. And friends, if we are gonna be reckless, if we think we can manage our sin or ignore it or kind of sweep it under the rug or or not deal with it the way Christ commands us to, then we're gonna really, we're gonna ruin our lives. But there's at least three things I can think of that happen if we deal with our sin recklessly. First, we're estranged from God. God becomes a stranger to us. Now, there is the omnipresence of God. This is God's always and everywhere presence. He is with us right now. But Puritans and and old theologians also like to talk about the felt presence or the manifest presence of God. When God manifests in the Christian life in a particular way, when we deal with our sin recklessly, what we are doing is estranging ourselves from God's felt presence. When we are walking in holiness, we are hearing God's voice. Obedience is joyful. We are, we are walking away from the gathering encouraged and full of life. This is what happens when we kill our sin. But if we refuse to do that, we are making God distant from us. So perhaps you, you do the thing where I read you know, chapter three of Colossians and then I look up 15 minutes later and I'm like, what did I just read? Perhaps you do the thing where you're committed to a time in prayer and then your mind starts wandering. I wonder, did the Lakers win last night? I better check check the score. And they made the playoffs. Are they gonna do well in the playoffs? I don't know what's gonna go on there. And you're just losing connection with God. Perhaps you come to this gathering and you're like, "This, this is boring. Or you go to community group and everyone else seems to be having some good stuff happen there, but you're like, this sucks. (laughs) I love it. Perfect timing. (laughs) Maybe, maybe those things are happening because you've estranged yourself from the felt presence of God and there's some type of remaining sin in your life that you are not dealing with. The second thing that happens if we're reckless with our sin is that we grow in hostility towards one another. If we have no vertical forgiveness, we're not gonna give away horizontal forgiveness. And if you were to look around this room, what you would see is a bunch of weak, fallen, feeble humans just like you. And here's what happens when a group of us get together. We hurt each other. We sin against each other. We lie about each other. We gossip against each other, right? And, and, and the call of the Christian community is to repent of those things, give forgiveness for those things, and then restore the relationship. But if we don't have this vertically with God, there's no way we're gonna have it horizontally with one another. And when we don't have it with one another, here's what happens. A root of bitterness takes place. And you build up a wall of hostility between your Christian brother and sister. And it's going to break down your relationships. And eventually you're gonna run away from this place and you're gonna go to a new church and then it's gonna happen there in three years. And you're gonna go to a new church and it's gonna happen there in three years. Because the problem is not the church, the problem is you not dealing with your sin. Last one. When we're reckless with our sin, our bones waste away is what the psalmist says. Here's what that means It means the Holy Spirit is in the good work of convicting Christians of their sin. When you feel convicted of your sin, this is a good thing. This is something to receive from God and say, oh yeah, 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 I need to repent of that because I wanna walk in the way you've called me to. But if we refuse to repent, God's gonna continue to convict and he's gonna discipline you and he's gonna press down on you and he's gonna make things tough on you and your bones are gonna waste away and your insides are gonna waste away. You're gonna be exhausted from faking it. You're gonna put a mask on and that just gets tiring. You're not gonna thrive in the way that Jesus has called you to. Friends, I cannot warn you enough about how dangerous it is for you to not deal with your remaining sin. As a matter of fact, in verse six, it says, on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Like Jesus has taken the full weight of God's wrath for our sin, but there is an idea in the scriptures that for the Christian, if you rebel against God, he's gonna put his thumb on you. And it's good. It's to draw you back. And when you refuse to repent, you are inviting that from God. On account of this, God's wrath is coming into your life. So that's dealing with our sin recklessly, but let's 
deal with it instead ruthlessly. Let's kill it. Let's take no prisoners. How? I'm glad you asked. 10 practices. Buckle up, baby. 10 of them. (laughs) Woo. All right, 10 of them. Number one, cultivate hatred of your sin. You don't kill your friends, you kill your enemies. And sin is your enemy. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, A couple weeks ago, when you saw that school shooting at Nashville, at Covenant School in Nashville, did you recoil? Like, oh! Did you do that? I did. And I hope the news... Like one reason for you to get off social media is so that the news that's constant doesn't just wear down your moral compass. Like get away from that. But but listen, if, if we have any form of moral compass left, when we saw that, we saw evil on display. And we naturally should recoil against that. We should hate that type of sin. Now, let me ask you a follow up question. When you leave a party and you realize you spent the whole time gossiping about someone and you're on the drive home, do you recoil at your own sin? I hope you do because it's evil and it's from the pit of hell and gossip is dangerous. When you wake up the next morning a little bit hungover in the bad way, man, do you hate that? We need to hate our sin. As Richard Sibbs says, Christ will not be sweet until our sin is bitter to us. So cultivate an active hatred of your sin. Not ambiguous sin out there, your own. Ask God, reveal any wicked way that be within me. List those things and hate those things. Number two, eliminate things that will cause you to stumble. You, you know the old uh, nursery rhyme we, we teach our kids? Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. You know that? What we're teaching them is this. If something is going to make you stumble, get away from it. If it's a place, don't go there. If it's a liquid, don't drink it. If it's a person, part company. If it's an image, don't look at it. If it's a song, don't listen to it. Matthew 5 says, it is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into the fire. What Matthew is teaching us is, if there is something that is going to cause you to sin, cut that thing out of your life so you don't move your way quickly into condemnation. It is better to lose something than it is to lose Jesus. Eliminate those things that will cause you to stumble. You know what those things are. I know what those things are. But we love them too much to get rid of them. Number three, flee from temptation. This is similar. Don't get near to it. Don't fantasize about it. Run from it. When temptation comes your way, you need to run. Now, I'm I'm gonna paint with an intentionally broad stroke here, okay? So hear me on this. I spent last week um, looking at a Nokia 2780 flip phone because I'm probably gonna get one, not as a burner, but like as an actual phone because I hate smartphones. Listen to me. You can get on whatever website you want to right now in this room. You can get on social media, which increasingly to me, again, broad stroke here, okay, don't, don't get mad at me. There are no redeemable qualities in social media. I just don't see it. All I see is jealousy, rage, bitterness, insecurity, isolation, loneliness, suicide, all of these things on social media. Misinformation, like you know why you're so worked up in a tizzy? Because of something that came from nowhere and is not true. And you read it on Twitter. I mean, come on. And all that social media does is it tempts us and we're like, yeah, but like, I, I gotta keep up with old friends. No, you don't. I don't even talk to my wedding party anymore. <laughs> Life goes on, okay? Well, I gotta, I gotta mark it. Okay, sure. But see how effective that actually is. Flee from temptation, right? I better keep going. Number four, Renew your mind with truth. Now, right now, church, don't think about a pink elephant. What are you thinking about? 
Like, that's crazy. Those don't even exist. But you're thinking about it. Now, here's what happens with sin. If we just sit and dwell and dwell and dwell and dwell and dwell and think and think and think about our sin, we are going to sin, which is why the commands of Scripture are set your mind on things that are above. Think about things that are right, true, lovely, and pure. Dwell on what is honorable and praiseworthy. Be renewed day by day by the word of his truth. Be sanctified by his word. If we are dwelling on the beauty and the promises and the truth of God's word, we are naturally going to replace our thoughts of sinfulness with thoughts of godliness. But I don't have time. Social media, again, John Piper says, uh, one way social media is gonna be used in the last day is to prove to us how much time we actually had to get into God's word. I get my screen time report at 9 a.m. every Sunday. I don't know why. Do you guys get it at that time too? Is there a better, more convicting time for that, you know, than right as church starts? It's at nine, by the way, not 9.15. Um, um, now listen, Our screen time reports will show us how much time we actually had to get in God's word and dwell on things that are true. Number five, determine to fight daily. You wake up every day with new morning mercies to fight that day's sin. There is no cease war with sin. We will deal with sin until we step into glory. So every day is an opportunity to put our foot on the gas pedal of sanctification. You have to determine every day If sin doesn't take a break, you can't take a break. Um, In the front of my Bible, I'll show you guys hopefully, uh, I've got some prayers right here and some prayers right here that before I read, I don't know if you guys can see that, it's really far away. Before I read my Bible for the day, I pray those prayers. And one of the prayers I pray is from the Lord's prayer. God, forgive me my trespasses. And then I list them out from the day prior. Do that. Determined to fight daily your sin. Number six, walk in confession and repentance. The scriptures teach us there is power in your words. And when we confess, which is saying, yes, God, I'm a sinner, and we repent and turn back to Jesus, we are weakening the power of Satan and our flesh and our sin, and we are giving power to God's spirit to work in our lives, which is why we, every week, put our elders in the back and say, go get prayer. Because when two or three are gathered and they pray and there's power in the words, the power of sin is gonna be broken in your life. But again, we're, we're sitting here saying, God, I'm so full of shame. Like, I, you, you don't know what I'm struggling with. I promise you, whatever you struggle with, what I struggle with is worse. I promise you what you struggle with, everyone else in this room is struggling with something worse. Be freed to find an elder and confess. Their jaws aren't gonna hit the floor. They're gonna say, let me pray for you and encourage you in the gospel. Walk in regular confession and repentance. Number seven, ask for the Spirit's help. You guys know the Spirit is God? And the Spirit as God, holy God of the universe, has every divine attribute of God including his omnipotence. Our spirit that dwells within us is, has the all power of God, which is why Paul in Romans 8 says it is by the spirit that we put to death deeds of the body, which is why Galatians 5 says it's the fruit of the spirit, not the deeds of the flesh, which is why Isaiah 26 says the spirit teaches us to walk as we should. Have you sat before the Holy Spirit of God and prayed and asked and pleaded for him to give you the power to overcome your own sin, or are you trying to do it by your own strength? Number eight, practice self-denial. A Christian discipline that we should walk in is actively saying no to some things in order to say yes to better things. I'm gonna say no to that meal so that I can say yes to fasting and getting more of God. I'm gonna say no to that thing I wanna purchase so that I can say yes to generosity for the sake of his kingdom. I'm gonna say no to that weekend getaway so I can say yes to the gathering with the saints of Christ. I'm gonna say no to selfishness so that I can say yes to serving serving God and his people. And here's what happens. When you get better at saying no, you get better at saying no. When you say no to yourself, it becomes easier to say no to your sin. If you are regularly practicing self-denial, when sin tempts you, you're just gonna be like, 
No. Right? Just say no. Dare. <laughs> Number nine. That was not intentional. Use the gospel. Do you actually believe the gospel? That Jesus Christ lived for us, died for us, has fully, freely, forever forgiven us of all of our sins and empowers us to, to walk in the newness of life? Do we actually believe that? If we believe that, it will show in how we respond to our sin. If we don't believe the gospel, here's what we're gonna do, what our first parents did. We're gonna cower, we're gonna hide, we're gonna try to clothe ourselves, we're gonna try to run from the presence of God like Adam and Eve. If we do believe the gospel, when we sin, what are we gonna do? Run to the throne of grace to find mercy and help in our time of need. Do you believe the gospel? And then finally, number 10, live a submitted life. Here's what I mean by that. If all of your life is submitted to God's use and obedience to him, then there will be no crack in the doorway for Satan to get in. There will be no wedge for him to get in and tempt you and for you to fall to sin. And so be enthralled with things that are better than your sin. Live the submitted life where you wake up every day and say, God, I wanna be used for you and for your glory and for the good of your people. Teach me to obey, and he will. Let us deal ruthlessly with our sin and kill it by walking through these practices. All right, final thing here, our reward for holiness. Now, if I can be honest with you, when we consider this idea of remaining sin in, in our lives, uh, it, it's both a relief and a heartache for me. It's a relief for me because it makes me feel like I'm not going insane. It's like, man, I, I have so much sin and I wake up and I hate it and I hate it, I hate it. And then I hear like, oh no, this is the normal Christian experience. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not alone. I have other brothers and sisters in Christ who are wrestling with this with me. And then it's a heartache because I just hate it. I don't want it. I don't want the brokenness of this world. But if we are committed to this daily fight of dealing with our sin, there's a beautiful reward on the other end of it. Look at verses nine and 10. Paul says in the second half of verse nine, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, here's what happens. Put off the old self and its practice, mortify it, kill it, get rid of it, and put on the new practices of following Jesus. You will be renewed in the image of your creator, God. Right, and here's what that means. You're gonna have greater knowledge of God, more awareness of his presence. You're gonna get the fullness of Christ. You're gonna live the life you wanna live. Your bones are not gonna waste away. You are going to have everything that you truly desire. Everything that we desire, we're trying to fulfill, but most often we just try to fulfill it at the wells of sin. But Jesus is saying, God's word is saying to us, don't fulfill it at the wrong wells. Go to the well of Jesus Christ and you are going to truly get everything your heart desires. You're gonna be renewed day by day into the image of your creator. I can't go too far there because that's next week. But I promise you, there is a beautiful reward for you committing to killing your sin. And it's more of Jesus. Let me close like this. I don't want to get, get accused of advocating moralism. Okay? Moralism says, do these things and God will love you. I am advocating for good gospel growth, which says God already loves you. Therefore, do these things in worshipful response. God's clear demand of us. Moralism or behavior modification simply pushes true sanctification further away from us. It makes us feel discouraged. It makes growth feel impossible. It makes us think God is disgusted with us and it traps us in a horrible tailspin. God's message to Christians is not, you're not yet holy, let me know when you get there. God's message to Christians is, you are holy, become what you already are. And if we believe this is who we already are, that viewpoint will foster within you and I confidence and passion and a true understanding of our sin. Knowing that our father sees us as he sees his own son, we are encouraged to make real, though slow, spiritual progress. God, by his grace, declares you and I holy, so we just become who we already are. 
Understanding that we are holy citizens of a holy kingdom makes us eager to fulfill our civic duty to mortify sin. Knowing we are saints reminds us of the gravity of evil. Sin is so horrendous and powerful that God sent his only son to pay for it. That's how brutal our sin is. We don't play around with it. Jesus died for it. Now let us die to it in response by the power of his spirit. So next week, again, we're gonna talk about vivification because we don't wanna just tear down and leave something hanging out to dry. We wanna put something back in its place. So we're gonna talk about what do we put on? What do we pursue? What do we get after? But for this week, church, I, I wanna commend to you a, a, an inspection, so to speak. As King David prays in Psalm 139, Father, search me and know me. Reveal to me if there be any wicked way within me. And then confront the reality of what's in there. And confront the brutality of sin. And don't play your sin down. Don't act like it's small in comparison to others. See it as it is, the thing that hung Jesus from a cross. And then, when you see it, here's how I want you to deal with it. Confess it. Find an elder today in the back. Find a brother or sister in Christ here at the church and say, can we grab some coffee? I need to talk about some things. And not because you want to like, you know, do the monk thing. Like, oh, I'm going to beat myself to hell for this. No. So that you can loosen the power of sin in your life and put on the way of Jesus. And so I want you to bow your heads for a second. I want you to just sit silently. Maybe you need to look at Colossians 3. And just consider in your own heart right now, your own life. Where do you need to repent? What do you need to turn from? Who do you need to seek forgiveness from? Who do you need to talk to? God, we confess we are sinners. We have wandered from you. We have rebelled against you. In your goodness, you sent the hound of heaven, Jesus Christ, to save us, to rescue us, to make us new, to clothe us in his righteousness and make us holy. Now help us, God, to be holy as we already are. Show us, God, reveal to us in our hearts, in our lives, in our mouths, in our thoughts, any wicked way that be, so we can expose that, turn from that, and walk in the newness of life that you have purchased for us. God, we don't want our bones to waste away. We don't want to stay trapped in sin. We want to, to walk in the life and the thriving and the flourishing and the joy that Jesus has purchased for us. And so God, forgive us where our sin has gotten in the way of that and we haven't dealt with it and we haven't considered it and we haven't turned from it. Empower us by your spirit to turn from our sin this morning and set us on a new path. Change us by the power of your spirit and the power of your gospel, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.